good to see all of you here today. Well, for those of you who uh, are new here, I'm launching into a, a sermon series um, in September, and we'll be going through the book of Ephesians, um, chapter by chapter. And I'm really excited about this because there's a lot of really awesome things that God um, has to show us through this wonderful epistle, this uh, letter to the church in Ephesus. And um, last, uh, last week in the last verses of my message introducing this book, um, the Apostle Paul was reminding the Ephesians the believers in Ephesus, that uh, they had received an incredible gift. And um, these believers had come to know Jesus, had been included with Christ when they heard the truth of the gospel of their salvation preached to them, and they stepped out in faith and they believed. And Paul was overjoyed with this. And, and furthermore, Paul tells them that they weren't alone, that Although they made this decision to follow Jesus and Jesus had forgiven them of their sins, they weren't alone because Jesus ascended into heaven. And after Christ ascended, the Holy Spirit was given to the people so that they would have someone to be with them forever, to walk with them through their daily lives. And the believers are marked with the seal of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's seal upon our lives is a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Paul was excited about this. He wanted to remind the people that they were not alone, that they could trust the Lord and, and the Lord would walk with them, not just beside them, but would walk in them and would be their strength. And he was excited. When something good happens in the kingdom of God, when, when God saves people from their sins and, and sets people free and, and seals them with his Holy Spirit for eternal life, when people demonstrate the change that God brought into them by loving other people, by loving on other people and, and treating other people the way God so graciously has treated them, See, seeing this ought to bring great joy and thankfulness to anyone's heart who longs to do the will of God in this world. And Paul, Paul longed to do the will of God in this world, and he, he saw this actively taking place within the hearts and lives of the believers in Ephesus. And uh, this applies to us today. Would you please turn with me in your Bibles or follow along with the overhead to Ephesians chapter 1. Our text this morning is found in Ephesians chapter 1 from verses 15 to 23. And we'll start by reading verses 15 and 16. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in all of my prayers. Can you, can you feel the passion that the Apostle Paul has and the affection that he has for these people? The response of the Ephesians believers, the, the Ephesian believers to the message of the gospel, it, it gave Paul great joy. It filled his heart with thanksgiving to God for them all. He was so glad at what he was seeing take place that he discloses to him, them that, that he has not stopped giving thanks for them, and remembering them in all of his prayers. <laughs> I can't imagine. Maybe it's, it's hard for us to imagine what it would have been like um, for Paul and the apostles when they first started spreading the news of the gospel and, and people began to come in droves, hungry for truth, coming to Jesus and seeing them blossom and change I mean, I get excited as a pastor when I, when I look out into the congregation and I see people that God has put his hand upon and he's changed you. He, he, you can see this work that's, that's, that's being accomplished within you. Uh, that's so encouraging to, to a leader 
to see that, and, and my heart overflows with thanksgiving for what I see God doing in so many of your lives. I pray that God would bring you to a deeper understanding of, of who Jesus is and, and what God has given you as an inheritance, much the same way as the Apostle Paul was giving thanks and praising God for what he sees taking place in the hearts of believers, we can take that joy as well and thank the Lord for what we see God doing in the believers around us. And, and you know, when we see that, when we recognize that, we can't help but, but love God. We can't help but love on people as well. Paul says in verse 17, he prays this. He says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. So Paul also knew that although the Ephesians had experienced a glorious salvation, he knew this, right? And he reminds them of this. And they'd been given the wonderful presence of the Holy Spirit in their hearts. It was absolutely essential that their spiritual life continue to grow and to deepen. Living in this world of sin, as you guys are full aware, it's a difficult prospect. The devil, who is the father of all lies, he tries to divert people away from the truth by influencing humanity, trying to get us to doubt the reality of God, trying to get us to doubt the reality of of his promises, and his actual ability to interact with us and to make a difference in our lives. He's a father of lies. And in the natural mind, under the influence of the sin nature and the, the tempter's um, wickedness and his, his interference, the atheist claims that there is no God for us to know. The agnostic, well, the agnostic says uh, there is a God, or maybe there's a God, but uh, he's so far out there that you can't really come to know him. But the Apostle Paul, having met God in the person of Jesus Christ, he came to know the truth. And that truth set him free. Paul was filled with God's Spirit. And he was ablaze with the message of God's kingdom come. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world was his message. See, there's, there's so many things out there that have the potential to cause us to stumble or to divert away from what God's best is for us. And Paul realized this. And the truth that we need to come to understanding is that we can't walk through life as a Christian. We can come to Christ and it's a miracle that we come to Him. But we can't, we can't walk through this life as a Christian effectively without God's Holy Spirit giving us His wisdom, insight and His revelation. We can't do it. With the natural human mind, we can't understand the things of God. Our natural mind is hostile to God. It doesn't want to submit to God, and it can't. That sinful nature we inherit from Adam all the way through is a very stubborn nature. It's rebellious at heart. And so easily led astray by temptations that are provided by the spiritual enemy of mankind. So, we need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth of God's Word to us. We need the Holy Spirit's work inside of us to draw us. We can't come to Christ on our own. Our hearts are too far from Him. Our hearts are too wicked and rebellious. It is a wooing that comes from the Spirit of the living God that has been given Now, the first thing that happens, right, is God, by His Holy Spirit, reveals His Word. 
the truth of his word to us about Jesus. In John 17, 3, we are told, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. See, when, we're come, when we come to God on a personal level like this, we're saved. By the grace of God, we're saved. When we believe and we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, we're drawn by that to the, by the Holy Spirit. We're drawn to that by the Spirit. And once we confess with our mouth and we, and we believe in our hearts, salvation comes to us. This is called justification, being forgiven for our sins and made right with God just as if we had never sinned. But even after we come to a knowledge of the truth of our salvation in Jesus, more grace is needed. As new believers, we must grow in His knowledge. We must grow in the knowledge of who God is. And this, my friends, is a lifelong process. It's a lifelong process. And relationally, to be all that we were made to be as God's children, we must increasingly know Him better. Otherwise, we stagnate, and our old nature pulls at us, and we get cold. And this is what we call sanctification, being conformed to the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Philippians 3.10, Paul tells the church in Philippi, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings become like him in his death. That's the heart of Paul coming out. Paul wanted the believers to understand that it's not only enough for us to know God as our Savior, it's also for, important for all of us to come to know Him as our Heavenly Father, the Father that never fails us, our friend and our guide through this life. And the better that we know Him, the better we know Him, the more satisfying our spiritual lives will be. And it doesn't mean that life's going to be easy. We know this. In this world, you'll have troubles. God doesn't promise us that we're going to have an easy go of it just because we come to know Him. But what He does promise is that the more we know Him, the more satisfying our spiritual lives are going to be. God's grace will fill us with the richness of joy that comes from the Spirit and the peace that surpasses all understanding that guards our hearts and our minds in Him. Now in verse 18 of our text this morning, Paul says this. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Now, our glorious hope as believers in Christ, our glorious hope is the return of Jesus Christ for his church and, and the granting of the gift of eternal life that is ours in Christ once this day is gone and this age has passed, when we are lost in our sins, we are without hope in this world. But in Jesus, we have been giving a living hope, a living hope that encourages us day by day. Our spiritual eyes, my friends, need to continually be enlightened to the reality of this hope. And this was Paul's prayer. The world around us is so dark and our enemy is so constantly trying to discourage us and dishearten us and to throw us off track. And this is why we need to pray for one another. Paul's praying for the Ephesians that their hearts would be opened, that they will see with their spiritual eyes, that they'll be enlightened. We need to pray for one another. Why? Because it is only by the power of God that we can do anything in this world. We can't advance spiritually on our own strength. We need the Spirit to walk with us, in us. And we need to be obedient to Him. 
Our spiritual eyes need to be opened. Paul understood that the hope that we have ought to be a dynamic force in our lives. Encouraging us to be pure, obedient, and faithful to him. (laughs) You know, it's not too much longer, my friends. I was just talking to someone here today. It's not so much longer when we are going to be before the Lord. You know, we don't have a long time here. Our days are, are numbered. You may think, oh, I got lots of time, but you don't really have much time. None of us do. And we never know when that day will come when we will be taken to the other side and we'll stand before the presence of God before His throne on the other side. The fact is, since this day is quickly approaching, we're going to be given new everlasting bodies. We're going to be transformed to be like Him. The pain of this world and this age in our bodies is going to be gone. It's going to be washed away. And that ought to motivate us right here and now to be like Jesus today. That's a tremendous motivator. And if our hearts connect with His heart, it will motivate us to be obedient, to be faithful. Now, we've seen movies, you've seen them, where they... uh, where, where you see the ancient knights um, trying to find the Holy Grail. Eternal life from a drink of this cup. <laughs> you know, there's something that resonates with people. Oh, I want that. Well, maybe you don't, but there's a lot of people that do. So they pursue the Holy Grail of life by looking everywhere else But Jesus, to them, it's all about them and what they can get and what they can squeeze out of their existence here to get as much life as they can get and to preserve it for as long as possible. But in Christ, my friends, the Holy Grail is a non-issue. Why? Because this world and, and its and its. Ways are passing away. But there is a hope in eternity that far outweighs everything that we go through here in this world. This is the Holy Grail. When we go to the other side, all things will be made new. God will give us new bodies that are, that are glorified. There won't be any more sin or evil. It will be taken away and we'll live in the everlasting paradise of God. But you see, Paul says this. Yes, the hope we have for ourselves is that. But Paul says he wants our he 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 prays that our hearts would be enlightened to know the hope to which he has called us, but also the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Hold on a second here. Just stop your mind here for a second. Stop right here. This isn't about us, people. (laughs) Yes, we have a hope for the future, and that is about us. But what Paul is saying here, that he wants us to be enlightened to understand the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. (laughs) You see, it's good for us to understand that we have eternal life. And that's something we can rejoice in. But even better still, it's important for us to understand that God does not exist for our glory. We, in fact, exist for His. God does not solely exist for our benefit. Although He benefits us when we come to Him, we exist for the benefit of Him. It's all about Him. And this is why in Revelation 4.11 there's a throne room scene before the throne of God and the thunder and the lightning and the colors and the, the creatures of various kinds are before the throne of God. And this is why there's, there's a picture of 24 elder kings from humanity 
that are before the throne of God. And all of these kings throw themselves prostrate before the, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. They throw themselves down and they take their crowns and they lay their crowns before his feet, before his throne, and they cry this. They say, worthy, you are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being, and they worship. Oh, my. Friends, one day we're going to be in that throne room, and not one of us here is going to be standing. I could tell you that. When we see the King of kings and the Lord of all creation before us, our breath is going to be taken away and we are going to fall prostrate before him in worship. We're going to worship. Because why? Because we recognize how good he is in giving us life. But we'll recognize that it's all about him and we long to give him glory. You see, in this society we live in, everything's about me, me, myself, and I. It's about what I get out of this deal. Well, you know what? As Christian believers, God wants us to have enlightened hearts to understand that it's all about Him. It's about His glory, the riches of His glory, and His inheritance in His people. So when we look at our brother and sister sitting next to us, what do we see? We see something that God is doing that brings Him glory. And that's why we pray for each other. That our lights would shine before men, that they see, may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven because it's about Him. It starts here and now in this world. And the less we think about us and the more we think about Him, the more effective and productive we are in our spiritual walk. And that's a fact. Paul prayed the spiritual eyes of the Ephesians would be enlightened, not only to see the hope of eternal life for ourselves and not only to see that God's glorious inheritance is in the other people that he's placed with us, in his saints. Paul honest, earnestly prayed also that the, the saints in Ephesus would, Ephesus would come to know, in verse 19, his incomparably great power for us who believe. Yeah. He wants us to understand the great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Did you hear that? The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is, is what God has provided for us who believe. And what does that power do? That power enables us to be obedient and to be faithful and to shine like stars in the universe in this world as we hold out the word of life so that all men might see who Jesus is through us, through the church. By this, they will know that you are my disciples by the love that you have one for another. My friends, God desires us to love him more and more. And he desires us to come into recognition that we can't love him more and more without him. And when we come to that recognition and we begin to love him, we begin to love others the way that he loves us. And that pow that's powerful. That's powerful. There is power in that. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. <laughs> now, God did not leave us to wander around in this world, beaten down, barely able to stand. God wants us to, to see whether our spiritual vision that he has not left us alone. He's living in us. The spirit of the living God is in his people. Jesus has given us power to live in victory over our sinful nature. No, there's going to be times when we fall and we falter. There's this process of becoming conformed to the image of Christ and we haven't got it all right. We're not going to get it all right until we see Jesus face to face. But I'll tell you this. That when we're in submission to God, in ever-increasing brightness, God will reveal the path before us. Because it is Him that accomplishes the work. And as He changes us, as He puts His finger on Clint's life and says, Hey, son, this is an area that I really want you to surrender to me more. Just let go. I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry. I, I know that I, I can't do this. So would you help me? Would you guide me? 
This is a heart after God's own heart. This is the heart of David desiring God to have full reign. Not that David was perfect. Not that you and I were perfect. We sometimes make mistakes. But our advocate, there's a way for us to come through Jesus, right? He puts his righteousness on our shoulders. It's not my righteousness that brings me into the presence of God. It's the righteousness of Christ, which is laid across my shoulders like a white robe. (laughs) You too. So, God desires us. And this is what Paul is trying to say to the Ephesians. That there's, there would be this revelation to them of, of the power of God that exists in them. Not that they are God, but that God decides to live in us. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There's no more that heaven can give. He is my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love. (sighs) The power of God living in us comes to us because of the work of God the Son. This gift of eternal life. This overcoming power. First 1 John 5, 1-3, the Apostle John says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one that, who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is what Paul's expressing. That's what Peter's expressing. We're able to overcome this present darkness in the world only because Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. He is and was and is to come. He's Lord. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Wow, the power of this scripture. You see, there's a very important fact that's mentioned in these two verses that many people don't come to realize. Some people don't come to realize how important the church is to God. You see, they... There's some that understand how important the church is uh, kind of peripherally. And they understand the value of, of, of themselves individually before him. But they have almost come to look at the church as an elective institution that you can either participate in or you don't have to participate in as a believer. If you choose to ride solo in your faith, the fact is that as a believer in Jesus, you're still part of his church. Even though you don't participate and work together with the others who are part of his church, some say they don't need the church. They say that all they need is solitude with God. They say that they're in church when they're isolated on their beautiful property in the back 40 of their community. They say they're in church when they're at the river's edge with a fly rod in their hand or at the top of a bluff when they're hiking or hunting or sightseeing. They say that church is a place of worship and that they go to church every Sunday or maybe once a month or maybe twice a year at Christmas and Easter. Now, while it's beneficial for us to go into the quiet, To be still and know that He is God and to speak and be aware of the majesty of our Creator in a retreat for prayer and meditation on the goodness of God. There's there's benefit to that. This is not the church. That is not the church. And it's good and necessary for us here as believers to, to be in attendance at church services. 
But, but the church, my friends, was never meant to be a place that you go. According to the scriptures, church is likened unto a body that when a believer comes to Christ, becomes a part of. And God says, and we see in this scripture, that he is the head of the church. And the church is his body, which is the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. In other words, God has chosen to accomplish his work by working in and through the people that he has redeemed. Do you get it? You are part of God's plan. God's plan is that the church works together, individual parts working in unison together to see God's kingdom come, to see his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. So, I will further say this. If you're not committed to the bride of Christ, the church, and you're not functioning as an individual part in that body, you're actually running your life contrary to and in disobedience to your calling from God. The church was designed by God. It's his idea. He's the master designer of it. It's not a place that you go to. This is a church meeting, but this is not a church. The building. You are the church. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 27. And I'm going to read this because it's so pertinent here. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all... Its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so that, as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we are all given one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop becoming part of the body. Start being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? You know what this is saying? This church as a group here, is not a pastocracy. I have one gift that I am using for the glory of God because he's given that to me. But every one of you also are part of the body of Christ. And every one of you has something that God desires you to serve him in. Because your life is not your own, my friends. Your life belongs to Christ. When you become born again, you don't just go solo. It's not a lone ranger faith here. You become part of the body of Christ. This is God's design. He desires to work in and through us. And the parts of the, that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are present, unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern. Hear this. That the parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. And I'm not saying this to bonk anyone. What I'm saying this is, if you're not experiencing the body, and if you're not participating in the work of the body, you're missing out. And you know what? The church is less effective and productive for the gospel in our community because of it. There's something that God's calling you to do and to be in the body. The question is, are you willing to follow him and be obedient? Paul's like, 
I want you guys to have eyes that are enlightened to see the hope that God has called you to, his glorious inheritance in his saints, and the power that he's, been, that he's given to you guys to be overcomers and to, and to be faithful and to carry out the, the things that he desires for you to do. You know, I'm not saying that everybody does everything. We don't. And even if you got a gift from God that you've used as a younger person, doesn't mean that God's not going to transition you as you get older. There's different times and seasons for different gifts. You may be elderly and think, well, what can I do? You know what? God has a place in the body for you. Maybe you were good with a hammer and nails and you were strong-backed and now you're well into your senior years and you don't have that anymore. Some people get discouraged and they just pull back and they sit back and they sit out. There's no retirement plan in the kingdom of God, friends. <laughs> There's... God has a purpose and a plan for you, even if you can't swing the hammer like you used to be able to. There's transitions that God takes us through, and each one of us has a part to play in that. So if you're unable to do something physically with the hands that he's given you, or maybe you're not able to speak, God's given you the opportunity to back the church and what he's doing in his church in prayer. You can be, we need prayer warriors. I, I'm calling all people in this place. We need prayer. We're not going to do a blessed thing out there, literally. We're not going to do a blessed thing out there unless we're in prayer. Because it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord, that anything is done in the kingdom of God. So we need to be totally dependent on him. In the New Testament, the, you see, there is a principle. And in the Old Testament, and it comes from an Old Testament principle of first fruits. In the Old Testament, you see, there was, God asked the children of Israel to bring them, bring to him the first fruits of everything that they grew. And they bring that to the temple as a gift, as a token of appreciation, knowing that everything that they have and everything they are actually is a result of God's blessing on them. And he called them to bring the first fruits to him and that they were his. See, our lives don't belong to us. We're children of God. He gives us everything on loan. So the New Testament principle is this. Okay? In the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, Paul mentions Christ as the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. See, the principle of first fruits continues. We're going to be raised to life as the latter fruits of the resurrection. Christ is the first. The first is the best. So often, my friends, we approach our faith and give God the dregs. We give God... The, the scraps left over that we have. But God's asking us to give the first and the best of our lives to him. The first fruits of all that we are, of that, of that which we have to him to see his kingdom come. His will be done. The church, my friends, will be effective in so much as his people lay down their lives and say, it's all yours, God. And that's what he wants. And this is what Paul's trying to encourage. He's trying to say, listen, you know, I pray that your eyes would be enlightened. That you may know the hope to which he's called you. And all this that we've talked about this morning, this is revelation from God so that we know who we are in him as a church, as a functioning church. We can't function properly unless everybody's functioning properly. So my prayer is this morning that you would ask God, what is it, God, that you're calling me to? How would you like me to serve you? Because it's all yours. And give him the first fruits. Not the dregs. When we do something for God, we do it with the best of our ability. To the best of everything that we can give. Why? Because he is worthy. And we're recognizing, just like the Israelites did, that everything comes from him. And we're just honoring him with our lives. And the first fruits of our lives.
ought to be given to him. Call the, uh, the worship team up. Would you bow with me in prayer this morning?